All right, welcome everybody. We are going to be kicking off this episode in just a minute. Uh, please hit that like button. Please hit that share button because we are going to be talking about uh, a movement for a people's party and what it's going to take to create and form a brand new party in America. Uh, so stay tuned. This is going to be, uh, I'm excited about this conversation. So I hope you guys are too. Make sure you hit that like, make sure you hit that share. Uh, and we're going to be starting momentarily. Okay. All right. I think we are ready. I think we're ready to kick this episode off. Welcome to this uh, Friday edition of Road Reflection. And as we do um, uh, on Fridays, we, we do a little Philosophy Friday action. Uh, that, is, uh, that is usually the, uh, uh, the thing that we do on Fridays, which is usually one uh, particular topic that uh, has something to do with, um, you know, a, a bigger, grandiose idea that we can kind of dig into and uh, talk about. Um, and see if, uh, if, if there are certain things that are on the right track, there are certain things that are not on the right track. Uh, so uh, that's, that's what we're going to do today. I hope you guys are excited um, to, to dive into today's topic. But before we get into this, today's topic, um, I do uh, want to do our uh, check-in. And uh, I'm, the, the, things, have been, things have been good. This week has been a pretty good productive week. I've gotten, uh, uh, you know, I was able to do a, quite a bit of uh, writing for content production. Um, I did figure out a format for the Zoom show. Uh, that's pretty exciting. And uh, in doing so, I think I want to try to, yeah, I might, have to, I might have to do a little bit of setup um, for the Zoom show and possibly have to, uh, get a piece of technology in order to do it. So, uh, I'm going to try to get that done today, um, to see if I can, um, if I can, uh, g make something work, uh, that I want to that I want to make work with the, with this situation, uh, so I'm excited to to do that. Uh, I feel a lot more motivated to to do it to to, to do just things in general this week. Um, I think last week was a, a lot tougher. I was also facing some physical ailments, hence the sunglasses. Some people have made a comment about it, um, um, positive or otherwise. I know uh, the, some people are like, "Hey, we'd love to see your eyeballs." And they are there, folks. They are underneath all this, but it is um, in order to get some decent lighting um, in the in in my my room right now. I am um, using a pretty solid spot uh, on myself, um, which means that I got to wear these uh, because basically what was happening was um, with the combination of this light. The combination of the screen um, and the amount that I was using it. I was getting migraines, I was getting headaches, um, I was getting neck and shoulder pains. So that was kind of affecting me. That was affecting my uh, overall mental health too because, you know, that it tires you out. Um, so I was kind of feeling a lot more tired and um, yeah, but I'm doing a lot better. Um, I'm feeling a lot better uh, I'm, I'm a lot more motivated. I have a lot more energy. I'm back to exercising on a regular basis. Um, I got to, I'm, I've been trying to, to be in touch with people to the, um, full capacity that I can be. I'm very much an introvert. Um, I've mentioned this a few times, uh, and I mentioned this again <laughs> because, uh, if you know, uh, just as sort of a reminder to to you guys and to myself, um, but if there's anybody new watching, uh, you know I'm very much an introvert. So when people reach out to me, I do appreciate it. That 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 is that is you know it doesn't remain untrue that I don't appreciate it. I appreciate the shit out of anybody 
reaching out and checking in just to see how, how things are going. I have a few people that do that on a daily basis and we chit chat a little bit. Um, but, uh, you know, I was doing it a lot in the beginning of this thing. I was checking up on as many people as I possibly could. So I was constantly, you know, trying to, uh, take care of shows that are falling out that, that are getting canceled and I would have to reschedule them and then checking up on people. So it was a lot. It was just overwhelming me. Um, so the first week, you know, first week, two weeks was, was a lot of that. And I kind of had to be like, okay, I have to pull back. I have to kind of set um, some restrictions on myself in terms of how much I can reach out to people. Um, but I've been reaching out to people. I feel like I found, you know, the capacity that I can reach in reaching out to people and checking in on them and chatting with them and making sure that everybody's kept up to date. You know, it's it's about once or twice a day. I can probably do, give out maybe an hour, two hours at the most um, because I, like I said, I'm very much an introvert. So a lot of um, my energy and uh, the way that I kind of re rejuvenate and regenerate myself comes from time alone, um, you know. And I, I will say that it, it, it is um, no different than if I was going to be touring and doing live shows um, because, you know, I am... The, the, these are usually pre-recorded, you know, videos and such, um, where where once I throw them up, I'll premiere them, which means that you guys will be watching like a premiere, like, you know, how it, like a show would premiere or debut or something like that. That's that's the feature on, on YouTube and Facebook that I utilize. And I stay in the chats um, and you guys leave comments and I respond to them. So that's like me hanging out with you guys, essentially. And um, and then, you know, anything additional is kind of like like uh, doing a show and then going out and having a drink at the bar with everybody. Um, and, I, and you know, that's usually what I do on the road. I go, I do a show, and then I go and hang out with people. And I can do a few hours of, of that, you know, maybe like two or three at the most, and, and then I kind of just tap out. Um, I've, I've used up all of the reserve energy that I have, and I have to go back and be, be alone and be contemplative and be introspective to myself um, and, and rejuvenate and regenerate. Um, from there, that's, that's just how my process works. So it hasn't really changed. And really what was, what I was doing in the beginning of all this was, was pushing that upper limit, uh, by, by really being focused on, uh, how everybody was doing. Cause I was very worried and concerned about a lot of different people, about a lot of different, um, you know, uh, issues and things that people might be facing and, uh, and, and just concern for my friends. But on top of that, also trying to do and maintain my own mental health, my own physical health and my own work health as well. Right. Trying to make these videos every day, trying to keep up with the content that I want to create, trying to write as much as I want to write, um, as well as the other, you know, administrative ancillary things that kind of come about. So the creative, the administrative, the, the caring thing, there was just a lot going on. So I kind of feel like I struck my balance. Um, and, it, and I've been doing a lot better uh, with it this week than I was uh, in prior weeks. So I'm, I'm doing pretty good. I'm doing pretty solid. Um, you know, and if I haven't gotten back to you, if you have reached out to me and, you know, I haven't been super responsive, um, I'm trying to be disciplined. I'm trying to have more focus so that I don't tap out. I don't burn out as quickly so that I can, um, you know, g give my energy to the things that I need to give it to in the moment that I need to give it to them rather than kind of be scattered all over the place and you know I'm only half-heartedly paying attention to what I'm doing with these videos I'm half-heartedly paying attention to my research to the writing to the to creating the zoom show to making sure I'm checking up on friends right um, I want to I want to be able to give the the fullest of all of my attention to all of these things and that's gonna that's gonna mean I'm not gonna be able to respond um, you know to to messages or texts and phone calls right away and you know, I do feel bad about doing that, but I, but you know, it's, it's striking that balance between taking care of others, but also taking care of yourself. So I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm heading into that mode. Um, so, um, yeah, I feel, I feel pretty, pretty good. Uh, and I kind of have to remind myself cause I do end up, uh, feeling quite a bit of guilt, uh, when, um, 
when I don't respond to people, when I don't return a phone call very quickly. That's just part of my personality. So I'm kind of working on, um, you know, saying, no, that's okay. You need to take time for you once, once you are at a uh, more stable mental health, more stable physical health, where you're not distracted by other things, then you can give all of your attention to making sure that your friends are okay, that, that you're making sure that you give to what your friends need in that moment. Um, so that's sort of where, you know, the thing that I'm trying to implement, I'm trying to move forward with, uh, because it does look like this thing is going to be going on for another month or two, um, a, you know, maybe, but uh, we'll see, we'll see. We, we, we still have a lot of, uh, lot of things to, to work towards, and, uh, and that's kind of what today's episode is going to be about, is something that we can also, we, we can all start working towards um, and, uh, and, and possibly something that we can all put our energies into, um, you know, whoever, whoever has some energy to spare can, can put into this. Uh, I'm, I'm excited to, to, to make this a part of what, what I'm, um, uh, all about. Cause it is something that I'm all about. Um, so, uh, let's, uh, let's dive right into it. So, um, I have, uh, been a part of, um, and kind of um, associated with the movement for a People's Party uh, for the last maybe two years or so uh, since I found out about what it was. Um, uh, the way that I found out about the movement for a People's Party, just to kind of give you a background on uh, my association with them, um, I, didn't, I didn't know about them till. Uh, you know, I would say like 20, late, like l mid 2017. And I really didn't pursue a whole lot of what they were about until much later in that year. I found out about them um, after I opened for Lee Camp in Pittsburgh um, at the Fun House and Mr. Small's uh, great venue there. And uh, we did a show, um, and I met uh, I met Suzanne, who is part of Movement for a People's Party. She's she's a, a you know a fixer in, in Pittsburgh, um, and we chit chatted uh, you know after the show, and I got to learn a little bit about them. And I said, oh, that's that's you know what what they're doing is is very interesting. You know, I I wish them all the success, but um, I don't I don't know what what my role or what my part in any of this is, um, going to be, and, you know, I kind of kept in touch with them, I would invite them to, 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 to come see shows and things of that sort, and then I decided, you know, um, during my album recording in, in 2019, last year is really when I stepped up, I think, a little bit more in terms of, um, possibly what I can do to, to help get the word out about this, and uh, and and really push on what they're talking about, what this coalition that they're building, what this new party that they're building is really all about. And I think more people should um, should know about them. So uh, for my album recording, I uh, made sure that they were uh, they were set up with a table. Um, so they set up a table, talked to some people, got a few people to sign up, which is excellent, which is great. Um, and I did the same thing again uh, this past December. Um, where you know they got to meet some more people as well and i hope more people got to know them so you know i'm 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 hoping that i can just utilize what small little platform that i have what little what little root that i have uh you know on uh, as a presence on the internet and as a presence in pittsburgh um, to get the word out about them i've also had uh nick Brana, who who is uh one of the uh, founders of Movement for a People's Party on my podcast. And a lot of the information that we're going to talk about today comes from his interview with Ron Placone. Um, and it'll this will be a good jumping off point because I am going to have Nick come back um, and, uh, and discuss a lot more about Movement for a People's Party, a lot more about um, what, they're, what, what we are discussing today and kind of go a little bit more in depth, a little bit more in terms of their platforms and what they're, what they stand for and, and, uh, you know, go, go forward from there. Um, so I'm going to be recording something, uh, next week with Nick, which is very exciting, but this will be a good introduction to everybody, um, you know, to, to get, to, to get a better understanding 
of what Movement for a People's Party actually is, how you can support them, and why it's necessary right now. Um, you know, um, and and I really believe in what they're doing. I really believe that we need to get out of this duopoly that we have, which is not really a duopoly, and I'll talk about that in a, in, in a moment. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I have kind of... I've always been this outsider in society. Um, I'm, I'm an Indian immigrant that's now a citizen of the United States, and I've never felt like I fit into either culture. Um, I've never particularly felt like I was like a very good uh, Indian person. Um, I never really fit into the framework of what an Indian supposed to be. And then when I came here, I was, a, I was like a double outsider because I never really understood what it, what the American culture was. I never particularly agreed with it all the way with that either. I felt like the, there, there was a lot of frivolity. There was a lot of, um, you know, hubris and, and, and boastful nature in, in, in American society. Um, you know, and, um, this, this admiration for um, anti-intellectualism that happened in the States. Um, you know, I never particularly understood it. I always kind of looked at it um, from an outsider's lens. And, you know, when it comes to politics, uh, I started getting involved, like I started getting interested in politics, at least when I started watching The Daily Show and I was like a nine, right? And really the reason why I started watching The Daily Show is because it was funny. I liked I liked John Stewart, um, and uh, and you know I I wanted to understand American culture a little bit more. Um, so that was kind of the the first way that I was trying to understand American culture. And so once I kind of started doing that, I you know I, I never I never really considered myself to be a Democrat or a Republican. Um, I think when I was a younger and didn't really understand the state of politics, I, or, or sort of the subtle nuances of politics, um, or economics or ideologies. And I was forming my own. Um, I think I would, I would listen to mostly what Democrats had to say because it seemed like they were on my side. Uh, and the older I grew, uh, by the time I was maybe in my 20s, early 20s, I don't particularly think that I was a Democrat. Um, and I never really espoused myself to be um, a Democrat. I, I, I think, you know, th when you, especially for comedy, it was a lot easier in my younger days um, to kind of make fun of Republicans because they were so outwardly uh, in my opinion, absurd and ridiculous. So it was kind of a little bit easier, but you know, the, the daily show, which is, which is sort of really for me ends up being the root for, for, for a lot of, um, my understanding of American culture and my understanding of American comedy and, and politics in general. Um, you know, John Stewart took shots at both sides. John Stewart hammered the Democrats and the Republicans and, in this era of um, oversaturated uh, mainstream media, in this era of oversaturation of content, we seem to forget that. We have a limited memory span, uh, which, which we really don't. Um, our, our brains are able to hold so much more information than we give it credit for. Uh, it's just we have no idea how to access said information, so we have to kind of repetitively go down this track. But, you know... Um, John Stewart attacked both sides, and I felt like he was making some valid arguments as my as my belief systems were um, being formed, as as my ideologies were being formed, and as they evolve and as they grow, um, they hopefully get sharper and better, and uh, hopefully become more humanitarian um, or, or rather more humanist. I think that's sort of the direction that I'm going. Um, but I've never considered myself to be a Democrat. I've never really considered um, wanting to be a part of the Democratic Party. Uh, so, you know, I, I got my citizenship in December and I had to register 
as a Democrat in the state of Pennsylvania, because the reason I even got my citizenship in the first place was either to vote for Bernie Sanders or Tulsi Gabbard. And, you know, they've they both kind of been uh, become disappointments um, in regards to the in regards to the notion that, you know, you can trust the candidate in general. Um, and over the years, I have become more interested rather in, in the candidate that you support in uh, talking about the ideas that you support. Um, I, I feel like that is a that is a far more important and far more interesting of conversations to have rather than saying I'm, I'm a Bernie supporter, or a Tulsi supporter, or a Warren supporter, or a Trump supporter, or whatever it is. Um, what, what do you believe in? What do you believe in? Um, and does the, you know, and once I started thinking about it in that lens, one, especially in my early 20s, once I started thinking about what do I believe in? What are, what are the ideas? What are the, the philosophies? What are the, the politics, the economics that I believe in? What, what, is, what is the nature of humanity that I believe in? Um, and how can I live my life according to that? And do I have any, any sort of uh, political entity that represents that? It was, very, um, it was very evident that I don't. Um, not in the current mainstream establishment level of politics. Um, I think the closest thing that I can get to right now in terms of an established party is possibly the Green Party. Um, and, you know, I don't agree with them 100% all the time either. Uh, and and that's, I think that's still good, right? Like you should have some um, pushback on the party that you support, on, on the leadership that you support. You should be able to be critical of them. You shouldn't be able to look through uh, everything that they do in, with, you know, with, with rosy colored lenses and, and things of that sort. And that's what's happening with a lot of people right now. Um, as being Democrats, is that they look at the party through these rose-colored lenses. Um, and what's also kind of interesting to me, too, as I'm kind of going in the stream of consciousness situation here, <laughs> um, is that um, there's a lot of people that in the beginning of all this, after 2016, uh, after they saw what the Democratic National Committee did to the DNC, did to um, Bernie Sanders, a lot of these people that, that believed themselves to be progressives and things, you know, were really vehemently against the Democratic Party. And they said, well, the establishment is, is corrupt and, um, and look at how they treated, you know, this, this, this politician that has been on the side of the working class for so long. Um, and they came out and they were like, we need to have a revolution, da 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 And they were very vehemently supporting these sort of radical different ideas. And then the second that Bernie um, endorsed Joe Biden, there was this polarized shift uh, where there was a, a good amount of Bernie supporters that... Uh, Essentially, we're like, we're still not going to support the establishment. That's not what we signed up for. The only reason why we were, you know, registering with this establishment party was to vote for this non-establishment guy, this radical leadership that, that we thought, well, at least we thought that it would be a radical leadership. And then there's a bunch of them. And this is the part that kind of gets me is they completely forget all of that stuff. And they go, well, no, the party is what we need to support. They forget the corruption. They forget how you know broken the system is, and they go, "Well, we need to we need to support the Democratic Party because, well, you know, it's the Democrats. They're good people. They're at heart, they're good people. They're just stuck in a corrupt system when they are the representatives of the system themselves, um, you know. And and the Democrats, you know, they really hate this progressive, alternative third party wing of. Uh, of folks on the left more than they hate the Republicans. I have gotten so much more attack from um, from hardcore party line Democrats, tried and two Democrats that are like, I have never voted for any other party except for the Democrats because the Democrats are the best thing in the fucking world and they're the ones that are going to save this country like they always have. You know, and it's just sort of the same sort of... Um, fanatical rhetoric you know there's really nothing else that i can come up with right now but fanatical that you hear from the republicans or that you hear from evangelical christians 
that there's nothing else out there. And this is the way that it has to be. Um, and, I, and I've gotten more attacks in the last probably four years from that side than I have from conservatives. In fact, what's interesting to me too, and I mentioned this a few times as well, is I, in the last four years, well, even at least since like late 2015, I've had more conservatives come to my shows and enjoy my shows and buy my merch and follow my work than I have liberals and people on the left. I'll have people on the left come and criticize me for, you know, making fun of um, establishment politics and making fun of democratic leadership. And people on the right will come up and say, boy, that was not what I expected it to be. I thought it was going to be a lot of bashing of me and what I believe in. But it seems like we believe in some similar things. You know, and look at the way that they attacked Bernie and Tulsi. And these were Democrats. These were Democrats that attacked Bernie. And Tulsi was, um, you know, part of the Democratic leadership. She was in the DNC. She was, she was going to be, you know, they were grooming her to take over the DNC and be the DNC leader. And she pushed back and supported Bernie Sanders. And so she, they threw her under the bus. You know, they, Russiagate failed on Trump. It didn't prove fucking anything, right? And then the whole narrative of collusion changed to, well, um, obstruction of justice. Okay, but that's not what you were arguing for three years. That's not why you levied fucking conspiracy theories for three years. And they, and they shifted that over to uh, Bernie and Tulsi, that they were Russian agents, that they're colluding with Russia, and um, they had no evidence and no proof of it. Right. But the country is that is not indicative of what the country really is. There's a lot of polls that say that, um, you know, people aren't Republicans or Democrats. That, that that is a continuing poll. And there is a fracture in the left. Right. There's a there's a big fracture in the left. Um, and a lot of it has to do with the definition of what a progressive really is. Um, there's there's, you know. There, there is a very singular focus on that definition. It's the same thing with socialists. I think, I think people have a very singular, defined notion of what these words mean, what these ideologies mean. And if you don't, fit, if you don't fit into that, then you don't. You're not that thing, and and it fractures the movement, um, and it and it affects the numbers of people that that support these movements that actually understand what it is. Uh, but in reality, as uh, Nick Barana points out in the interview with Ron Placone, is that we really are the majority. Um, there's a lot of people that believe in these ideas that are considered progressive or socialist or whatever it is, right? Whatever the, whatever the fucking label they've espoused to it, whatever the label that they have levied fucking attacks over and over again at, uh, that they have smeared and they've run propaganda campaigns about, um, the issues that 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 these these labels represent are actually the majority. There's a lot more people that want Medicare for all. There's a lot more people that want major environmental reforms, and a lot more people that want to take money out of politics. A lot more people that want a less co corrupted government leadership. A lot more people that do want a universal basic income tied into a federal jobs guarantee. A lot more people that want a plan for automation. A lot more people that want better housing conditions. Right? Like, the, 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 there's a whole movement going on right now about. Uh, how how we need a rent freeze and we need a, a better adjusted economic system that we can use during this pandemic and then coming out of this pandemic going forward we need to change a lot of that stuff um, and a lot of people the reason why even though they believe in these things they're very afraid to call themselves um, you know these terms and, and continue using these terms is because there is that propaganda that's against it that if you do call yourself a socialist then you're then you know you oh you're a danger to this country or if you call yourself a progressive then you don't care about conservatives that you don't care about liberals then you don't care about the importance of electoral politics or, or whatever it is right uh, but if you look at it 
all the people that co co consider themselves to be socialist, part of the socialist alternative, the DSA, uh, the Green Party, uh, any environmental activists, even conservatives, even libertarians, even some some constitutionalists, right? Um, you know, the, these people all kind of have very similar belief systems, if not the same. Um, so it's really about creating a coalition uh, surrounding all of those people. So let's talk about what's actually wrong with the Democratic Party. Uh, because I'm sure there's a lot of, a lot of you know, Democrats that are going to look at this and go, well, what the fuck, Krish? How dare you go against this party that is championed for civil rights and that is championed for, for, for working class rights? How dare you? You son of a bitch. You dirty bastard, right? And because they'll love attacking anybody that doesn't agree with their party. So, I, I do agree with Nick when, when he makes, when he talks about this, because if you pay attention to the way history has moved forward, um, you know, it, the evidence is right there. There's been a constant pattern of deception um, against the working class people, right? Um, it, it, the Democrats will come out and say that they are a party for the working class people, that they do believe that, you know, we are the future of America and we need to be propped up and we need to be taken care of and we are the ones that really make the change. And, and that's just not true because uh, both the Democratic Party and the Republican Party are corporate parties ruled by Wall Street and they all have lobbyists. And some of these lobbyists are in the higher ranks of the um, corporations that control the elections, the DNC and the RNC. Uh, particularly the DNC, they have lobbyists in the higher ranks of the DNC. Like they sit on, the, so they make the decisions, right? So we are actually not involved in making any sort of legislation. When was the last time Nancy Pelosi asked you whether you were okay with the fucking legislative decision she was going to make? I don't, you know, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't remember getting a call. I don't getting uh, remember getting a call. Uh, from any governor about any decisions that they make in the state of Pennsylvania. I don't remember getting a call when my state representatives decide to vote for a corporate bailout bill over providing a you know a emergency UBI for the American people. Don't remember. Do you do you guys remember getting a call? Do you guys remember when your representatives gave you a call and was like, hey, I'm 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 thinking about voting for a huge corporate bailout. Uh, it'll give about four point three trillion dollars, and then uh, the idea is that it's going to trickle down. I would, I, I bet you, mo more, more people than not would have come out and been like, "That's a fucking terrible idea." When the fuck is that work? Why are you doing this? I voted for you, thinking that you wouldn't do this to me, and that's exactly what you're. Why are you doing this? What the fuck? I don't remember getting that call. What they do is that they take these committees of corporations, these lobbyists, and the, the people that. Uh, you know, really make the bills and really make the legislation in this country. They go into back rooms. They go into closed door meetings with with weird, you know, maybe a blood orgy that happens. And I don't, I don't know. I don't know what the the protocol of making legislation in America is. I'm sure. I know there was like an animated movie that kind of showed you how a bill becomes a law and through the votes and all, you know, all that. Stuff. But I'm, I'm sure that was an animation for kids. Okay, how are you going to animate? a blood orgy and make it okay to show in schools. You can't do that. So you got to come up with something different, you know? So it's like, oh, let's make a, you know, a talking piece of paper. That, that, that'll get the kids. That'll get the kids. You know, I'm sure they have some kind of altar uh, the, uh, and uh, uh, robes. Um, uh, all, all good, all good uh, closed door organization have robes. Um, you know, because when you when you get when you know that's the best way to, um, uh, it's loose, it's billowy, it's airy. You know, so so environmentally speaking, these rooms get very hot, very hot. Um, what you know, because what you, what you have to um, account for uh, is uh, it, not only is there a person here, but but also a a a a, a representation of their corruption. Uh, and once you, I mean, that's double population in a room, you know, so if it's Mitch McConnell, Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, 
uh, Mike Pompeo all hanging out in a the room. They also have a, a, a physical manifestation of their corruption. So you got to wear robes. This is going to make it airier. Um, and, you know, sulfur is involved as well. Uh, so uh, the temperature is going to go up. So you want something loose. You want something billowy, something nice. Uh, and then you make the legislation. Um, and, uh, you know, you, 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 you sacrifice a virgin uh, as you do everybody. That's very key, very key. And then uh, and then that's how and then they make the legislation happen. You know, so. Um, <laughs> that's how that happens. So you have you have these this this duopoly that is essentially um, it's not a duopoly actually it's just one party masquerading as two it's represented by the same thing uh, the Republicans in this country have been pushing more and more to the corporate right and instead of and if the Democrats were truly about working class people if they were truly about supporting the working class people. Um, they would push back against that and they would run with a little bit more of a populist ideology uh, but they don't they uh, they validate that corporate right they they solidify it they put it in place they make they make sure that uh, it is going to be harder for us to fight back uh, in in creating something um, in 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 transforming something from within and creating a better party from within um, and you can see that with with, you know, just in the last two Democrats that have been in office with Clinton and Obama, you know, you had the you had NAFTA, which was a horrible deal for the working class. You had TPP, which is a horrible deal for the working class. Uh, you had you had an increase in wars, uh, which is also a horrible deal for the working class, because uh, the, the working class are the ones that are used as cannon fodder for these wars for the rich. What do, what do people get out of these wars? Uh, nothing. You know, they're like, oh, but the gas prices will go. The, the fuck they will. When the fuck do the gas prices go down? Because we were in a war. That's never fucking happened. You're, that's crazy to believe that that's what's going to happen. Um, you know, and Obama did it and, and, and Clinton did it. People forget Clinton was in Africa. Somalia was, was Clinton. Uh, Eastern Europe was also under Clinton. Uh, what else? You, you had the Bush tax cuts that were essentially solidified by uh, Obama for corporations. Um, expanded the bank controls. Uh, you know, Obama bailed out the banks. Glass Steagall was um, revoked under Clinton. Uh, the banks are now freer to do whatever the fuck they want to. Fuck over as many people as they want to. And um, and and basically, w uh, when that happens, uh, the Democrats look at the banks and they go, "Hey, you got pay you silly gooses, huh? With your with your with your exploitations, huh? Come on, come on. We talked about this, okay? We come on. We talked about this. Don't you gotta you gotta stop being a silly exploiting goose, okay? Now here's here's an extra trillion, and uh, and you spend it wisely." All right, don't don't spend it all in in one place with your tax with your stock buybacks. Okay, you you oh, guys are gooses, silliest of all the gooses, these guys. They control uh, the narrative with the Telecommunication Act. That was Clinton. That that you know, uh, we're we're looking at the, the the net neutrality being in danger because of because of that. So that's all Democrats. So as much as Republicans. Um, actively go after the civil rights and push it to the corporate right. The Democrats don't do anything to push back against it. They kind of just toe the line and, um, you know, they kind of keep things where they are. They, they support those bills. They solidify them. So it's, and then, you know, they make a public speech about, well, these, you gotta, the internet should be open and free. You know, we got to take care of the working class people. We got to do these tax. You buying it? You guys buying it yet? You know, does does my furrowed brow show that I care about people as I'm cashing the check from the corporations? You guys, does this, does this show sympathy? Is this human sympathy? That's basically how the Democrats act. 
So now uh, we're looking at uh, the fact that a two part a two party system has failed America, and a new party is essential. And we do have other um, we do have other parties as well. Uh, with libertarian screens, those exist as well. But you know we should have we should have more parties in in America, and they should be represented within our uh, congressional system, which which they're not. They're not. And you know before everybody goes, oh well, you know why don't they go for these lower tickets? We are going to get to that in a minute. But you also have to realize that even on even on the down ballot tickets on uh, gubernatorial races and uh, congressional races, the Democrats and the Republicans have made it so that these third parties can't even get ballot access to some of them. So you got to push back against that, and that's really going to come from come from whether we decide to support this party that has not supported us. So new party is essential, and everybody's going to sit there and go, "Well, Chris, this is ridiculous. It's it's impossible. How are you going to create a new party that's never been done before?" And that's actually wrong, as as Nick pointed out in the interview with. Uh, my good friend Ron Placone, um, the Republicans replaced the Whigs in the 1850s. That's essentially how that happened. They created a new party. Uh, you know, they the, the Whigs were pro-slavery. Their base were anti-slavery. They were abolitionists. And the Whigs basically pushed a, um, you know, pro-slavery agenda they pushed a, a, a pro-slavery platform uh and the abolitionist base was like well you y'all can go fuck yourselves we're not gonna we're not gonna vote for that that's not what we believe in so we're not gonna vote for something that we don't believe in that's crazy uh and they didn't they didn't vote the the party kind of Collapsing out of that came the Republican Party, which was an uh, abolitionist party. In 1854, they had a founding convention uh, for the abolitionist Republican Party, uh, and uh, and you know they put Lincoln, they they pushed for Lincoln, and they and that and now everybody knows you know Lincoln. Oh, Lincoln was uh, you know the great well, one of the greatest presidents that we've uh, ever had, uh, and and there have been six of these in our in our. Uh, American political is- history, uh, six realignments um, of political parties. Uh, some of them basically took the same political party and just kind of uh, shifted it over. Uh, you know, they kind of adopted new principles. They adopted new ideologies that they were going to support. Um, some of them straight up created new ones um, and, you know, pulled away from these establishment parties uh, some of them have been more successful than others, but really, in order to make these parties successful, it it is going to take time, and it's going to take people, it's going to take the working class people to stand by their beliefs rather than the party, rather than just saying, well, this party sounds nice. They do pay lip service to me. You know, they do kiss me on the cheek while they're cutting me in the uh, in the side there. But that kiss is pretty cool. As I'm bleeding out, it's nice to get a kiss, you know. So that's essentially the process of creating that new party, though, is the movement for a people's party is talking to um, the left and the right. Because I think there's a lot of people on the left and the right uh, that believe in the same thing that believe that, you know, privatized health care is not helping the American people, that there is too much corruption in American politics, that there's too much money in politics. Um, so they're building a coalition of people that are supporting this movement. And then they'll, they'll create a founding convention and push for ballot access. And they'll go in all levels, right? They'll go from like city council seats um, to... To all the way up to congressional seats, uh, and that'll that'll be the push for in 2021, and um, you know, and then in 2024, hopefully, be able to run a presidential candidate. Um, and in order to get ballot access, it's all it's a little bit different state by state. But one of the things is to get between 800,000 and one million signatures uh, to say that there are people that will support this party, uh, and that's total across the country. 
800,000 to 1 million people across the country have to sign up. So you can sign up and, and basically sign to get ballot access uh, to a third party. That's, that's really all we need. And there's, what, over 300 million people in this country? Um, are you really telling me that there are that many people, that there aren't at least, at least 3 million people that don't want something different in this country? That 3 million people don't stand for what the movement for a people party will stand for, that don't stand for what the Greens stand for, that don't stand for what the Libertarians stand for, and won't push to get ballot access for these, these parties? I don't buy that to be a reality at all. I think that people are just scared, and, and they don't need to be because um, in a moment like this, the more solidarity we have, the more that we're just going to win. Um, you know, So the more of us that kind of stand together in pushing for a uh, movement for a People's Party or a Green Party or Liberty, whatever it is, and getting them ballot access. So if the complaint from these sort of uh, supporters of the corporatocracy are, well, you shouldn't be looking for president. You're ruining it. You're, you're taking votes away from the Democratic Party. You're taking votes away. Well, those votes don't belong to the Democratic Party, by the way. They have to earn those votes. The party doesn't, uh, that, that's, that's authoritarianism. You're looking at, you're essentially talking for a Democratic Party dictatorship. That doesn't make any sense. Like, if those words hit your brain and you're like, mm, yeah, I like that. Is like, no, you don't understand what words mean. So one of the questions that was asked is why not do a green enter, right? Why not? Um, why do, why don't the people from the movement for a People's Party push to to join the Green Party? Um, and you know, because it's because it's it's creating a new party. Because we need a little bit more diversity in thought. Because the American voter isn't a monolith uh, that they have to vote between one or the other. So you know, having more sort of um, pro-worker, pro-solidarity parties that, that might be a little different and might be a little bit more skewed is good. And that's what the OG Republicans did with the splitting of the, uh, of the Whigs. And it's how you break down the power that these corporate parties have. So, so that's what the, the Movement for People's Party is doing. Um, the same thing that the Republicans did to the Whigs. The Whigs were sort of this powerful mainstream party uh, that had a lot of power and control. And by forming this party, they took that power and control away because a bunch of people stopped supporting the Whigs. So this is what the movement for a People's Party is doing, but they're doing it for both the, the Republicans and the Democrats. And they're siphoning uh, the voter base to say, these people don't represent you, and here's how. Here's all the facts that we are presenting. Here's what, what we can do is a little bit different. And I hope you take this bold action with us. One of the major things that a movement for a people's party is doing too um, is redefining what a political party actually is. Um, making people feel like they can participate in their democracy a lot more. And um, right now, you know, I, I get this shit all the time being a new voter is a lot of people will come up and be like look it's your duty to go into a voting booth uh pull a lever um for who we say you should and uh and that's it and everything else that comes through is just what it what happens and we kind of have to sit back and accept it uh, you know and roll our bellies over and give up and uh and that's 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 the role of the voter in um the current state of politics is and it's a very passive role um and i don't i don't buy into that at all i don't think that's look every everybody has an obligation to be involved in politics everybody has an obligation to have their voice represented in that system that's what it that's what it should be that's what a democracy should be um you know and so you can't just say well i pulled a lever and i did my duty well, your duty is supposed to mean something. And if you're pulling a lever passively and kind of subserviently, well, doesn't that kind of, I don't know, take away from voting? Doesn't that kind of take the power away from it? Doesn't that kind of take the, the importance away from it? With the Movement for a People's Party, the leadership will be elected, but they're held accountable. So, so 
if you, you know, if somebody from the MPP is elected and you don't feel like they're just standing true with what they said, standing true with um, the principles of the movement, then we the people hold them accountable and say, wait a minute, this is not what you said. You know, so if Nancy Pelosi made a speech at some point where she says, oh, we're standing up for the American people, we're going to do the best that we can for the American people, and this is the way, and then she goes, and the way we're going to do that is uh, by giving $4 trillion to Wall Street, and we go, whoa, 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 hold on a second, that's not helping the American people, it's never helping the American people. What about this option that gives money directly back to the, 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 the disenfranchised American people? And she goes, well, that's not how things operate. Well, then you don't get to be in power anymore. You're going back on your word. We have to hold you accountable for that. Uh, a big difference, too, is that this is not supported by either political party's direct action. Uh, you know, the MPP has a, a direct action. They support activists and other movements, uh, other activist movements, um, you know, uh, and they are for that. They are for protesting. They are for... Uh, expressing a difference of your opinion and saying, you know, what can we do to, to, you know, maybe reach a middle ground. What can we do to help you guys achieve your goals here? How are we not doing what what you think we should be doing? Um, and listening to that, and and I don't think there's a lot of leadership that does that. There is a lot of leadership that looks at protesting as, you know, oh, they're just spoiled brats being all spoiled. Brr. They, th they chuck out people that voice a difference of opinion from public meetings. They, they call them, oh, you're too emotional. You're too emotional. Well, I think you're a little bit too unemotional when it comes to fucking people losing their homes, people losing their jobs, people losing their income, not being able to afford food, not being able to take care of their family. I think you're a little too unemotional about it. I think it's okay to sit there and be like, this is fucking bullshit because it's bullshit. And you should be able to sit, as long as you have control over that emotion, it's it's reasonable. And I think a lot of these activists do. They do have control over their emotions. They are just expressing that this emotion exists and we feel angry about this. And, we sh and you shouldn't be d doing something that is against the working class. So what platforms do they believe in, right? We've talked about how the Democratic Party... Uh, essentially uh, created legislations and acts and um, put forward, uh, you know, laws that don't benefit the working class. Well, um, a lot of MPP, uh, you know, is uh, very similar to Bernie's platform. So there you go, you know. So if you're a displaced Bernie supporter and you're sitting there and I go, I got to hold my nose, I got to hold my nose and pull that lever and passively participate in democracy... Uh, well, you got a place to go. You got something you can support. You got something that you can put your weight behind. Um, you know, one of the big things is UBI, a universal basic income, uh, in order to address automation. And this is going to be different than what Andrew Yang proposed. I think what Andrew Yang proposed was a very rudimentary kind of compromised version of universal basic income it kind of um you know didn't it, it didn't really take into account um the the social protections and social programs that are already in place and use that as a jumping off point rather it it used that as a supplementary option um it really didn't help the, the american people all that much uh it um if you're really going to implement UBI, it has to be something that's going to address a major level of displacement of labor. And I don't think, I think he talked about it and he did address it, but his plan doesn't really uh, um, talk about it all that much. It was very rudimentary. I think it was meant to get people that were scared of the word socialism on board with something like UBI. Um 
you know, and, and we do have the rise of automation. This has been happening for a long time. This is not just all of a sudden we're like, oh, tr trucking companies are going to be using or, or you know, uh, automated trucks or, oh, they're self-driving cars used by Uber. This has been happening for a long time. Grocery stores have been doing it for a super long time. Self-checkouts. I mean, self-checkouts are essentially just automation. You know, that's essentially all they are. Um, they, they're, they're automating the worker. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of... Um, you know, corporations start ramping this up because I bet the because of the quarantine and because of this whole social distancing thing of well, I don't want to get in anywhere near another human. Stay back, stay back, humans, stay back, right? That that sort of pushback that we have um, has probably pushed more people to use the self checkout um, than they would on a normal basis. And I wouldn't be surprised if going forward they were going to employ more of that self-checkout in the retail and food industries, especially on a corporate level, right, which is going to displace a lot of those workers. And there's a shit ton of retail workers. There's a shit ton of retail workers. And if you displace all of them, what are we going to do? Those jobs don't exist anymore. And there aren't just magical new jobs that are going to be created in, in the absence of this job, right? There's no replacement. There's no retraining. So what are we going to do? Well, you have to create a UBI system um, that ensures that if you lose your job, we got you. We're, you're, you're taken care of. Don't worry. We got your back. Um, you know, and, and it's, it can be mixed with a federal jobs guarantee so that people, you know, do feel like they have work to do. So... If you are somebody that's like, eh, I've never really thought about what my passion was. I just want to be told what to do here. Okay, I have no interest in, in kind of creating something. I'm, eh, I, don't, I don't want, that's fine. That's not for everybody, right? Some people are, are better at just taking directions to somebody else and implementing that and putting that in place. And that's okay. And if, you know, so, so federal jobs guarantee would help something like that. But I think uh, federal jobs guarantee without UBI, um, probably not great. It's not going to end well. Um, so I think they kind of are complementary. They kind of go hand in hand with each other. Um, Medicare for all, that's a no-brainer. I think more people want uh, Medicare for all than what is actually being projected. Uh, Health care is a human right. Um, and uh, and that's, been, that's been talked about for a super long time that healthcare is a human right, you know? Um, and more people are, are, are lining up with that. More people have lined up with that. So again, uh, both of these, just these first two issues alone, the Democratic establishment is against. Joe Biden straight up said that he would veto a Medicare for all bill. If, if Congress agreed on it, Jay Paul and Bernie Sanders bill, for example, and they agreed, they approved it, it went through the House, it went through the Senate, it got to Joe Biden's desk, he would not sign, he would veto it. Straight up said that. I don't know, does that sound like it's somebody that lines up with your belief system there? It doesn't line up with mine, it doesn't line up with my thoughts. So if a universal basic income idea comes into play, uh, you know, what's he going to say about that? I don't even think he knows what this is, to be honest. Another thing they talk about is the Economic Bill of Rights. The Economic Bill of Rights. Uh, this is ensuring that people have, um, you know, financial access to food, water, housing, healthcare, recreation, and this is all stuff that, by the way, FDR talked about back in 1944. Um, you know, 1944, 60 years ago. 60 years ago, we were talking about this. Uh, and we didn't put it in place, and we should have, and we still can, because the way that it's built now, money is a limiter. Money is not this expander in our society. It doesn't open up opportunities. Uh, for most of us, um, money is a limiter. Most of us can't do things because we don't have the money to do them. Most of us can't purchase things because we don't have the money to do them. And, you know, the... The old argument is, well, just go make more money. Well, wait, where? If you're already working 60 to 80 hours, 
two to three jobs, where are you going to go get more money? Where are you going to go find more time? Where are you going to create this energy for yourself as a human being, as a living thing, to just go make more money? Especially in a system that, you know, has stagnated the minimum wage for 10 years. Where's that? Where are you going to get paid? And then if you ask for, oh, don't be greedy. Don't be greedy. You're being greedy. $15 an hour with that bullshit. You're being greedy is what you're being, okay? These CEOs need to make 252 times more than you. And that's big. I mean, they have yachts to buy and uh, 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 people to, to uh, tweeze their ball hairs. That's, I mean, they got to pay that person. I mean, they don't because it's an intern doing it, but, you know, the thought's there. The th- and the thought's what counts. You're just being greedy. That's how they look at it. With the UBI and this Economic Bill of Rights, um, this would be a dynamic change in our society where um, you wouldn't be looking at money as a limiter, but it would expand you uh, to creating um, more innovation, to more productivity, to us feeling like we are, we are being taken care of, where our work isn't being exploited. Uh, you would, you would have creativity and intellect and, uh, innovation being more cherished than competition and profit, than needing your name up in lights. It's cool to see your name up in lights, but is, I think it's cooler to know that, uh, we're all going to be taken care of and we all can support on each other to do that. I think that's way cooler than having my name in lights. Uh, one of the other things they talk about is reducing a, uh, reducing it down to a four-day work week uh, for the automation transition. So people can kind of get used to having more time to do what they feel like is important. Um, and the argument that's always used against this is, oh, so you're going to create a bunch of artists. That's what you're going to, oh, a bunch of, uh, no, not everybody's interested in arts. What if you really wanted to work on cars and you didn't get an opportunity to do that? You know, what if you want to start a, a, a food pantry and you didn't have a way to do that? What if you wanted to start a vertical farm and you didn't have an opportunity to do that because you didn't have the time or the money? Uh, you had to work at this office job. You had to work at this retail place. You had to go into you had to go into banking, which is not what you wanted to do. You know, now you can pursue your passion. You or, or you can look at it and go, well, where where can I fit in? What is what is a a missing element in society that I can contribute to? And then you go and do that because this gives you a sense of purpose. This gives you a sense of meaning. With UBI and all that, people can do that. And a four-day work week means that you have more time to, you know, donate to pursuing that. Now, UBI also needs rent and housing control, uh, which means that just because somebody is getting, let's let's just say for the sake of easy math, a thousand dollars a month, you can't increase your rent. So that the rent is now eight hundred dollars a month, instead of it being four hundred. Because you're like, well, you have the money, you can just no. You there has to be a flat out rent control, um, and no monopolies on this thing either, uh, because th- because now without this, you know, major housing debt, um, people can actually like pursue what they want to. They can actually like take a responsibility. They can expand their lot, make their lives a lot better instead of worrying about how they're going to pay off these debts. Um, and that's also going to, you know, I think that's also going to, I've I mentioned this once or twice before in the discussion of UBI eh, eh, is, um, you know, it is going to change the way that we look at real estate in general, that um, a one bedroom apartment in New York City should not cost more than one bedroom apartment in Boise, Idaho, or Houston, Texas, or Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, or Washington, D.C. Why would you do that? 
there is absolutely no reason for it. They're all cities. They're all hubs. They all have people. They all have in particular industries that do particularly well. They all have places of recreation. They all have places of health care. They all have places of, of feeding each other. Why, why are we claiming that New York City is worth more than Washington, D.C. or Pittsburgh or Cleveland? This insane idea will be, I, I think that's, it's a crazy idea. Because I'm in New York City, I have to pay $4 more for a slice of pizza. And this is not going to be a popular opinion. Uh, uh, I've uh, had uh, better pizza in Pittsburgh than I have in New York. I've had better pizza in Buffalo, New York than I've had in New York City. So, you know, this notion of real estate being tied into the city that you're in uh, will probably diffuse that idea. So that if you if you do have to move to San Francisco because because you like being by the bay, because you like the Golden Gate Bridge, you can do that. And you don't have to sit there and be like, well, I don't have the money to live in San Francisco. If you want to move to New York City because you want to be in New York City, uh, then you can do that. And not say, well, you know, it would mean starting all over again. You can just do it. The Movement for a People Party also says that Social Security is an obligation by the government. Um... You have Democrats like Joe Biden that have constantly wanted to slash Social Security, decrease the Social Security budget. Um, We're at a point where I don't think my generation is looking at retirement. I take a day off and I have a panic attack because it's like, oh, my God, I'm not making some making content that might have somebody donate something to me. And, oh, my God, you you know, like that's the uh, sheer panic that I existed uh, I don't think I'm looking at retirement I think when my body starts failing um, you know maybe in my 50s or something I'm not going to be able to tour 40 some odd weeks of the year and I'm going to have to figure out what the fuck I'm going to do but social security should be an obligation by the government that if you have been in the workforce for 50, 60 years something like that Um, you know, because some people work till, I I know people that are currently working in their 80s. When I worked at, uh, at Starbucks, there was a woman that was in her, like, 70s that was a barista. Holy shit. That lady was slinging the shit out of some lattes. You know, putting up with every single entitled suburbanite that would come in. She's fucking whipping them out. She's quick. And they shouldn't, and you, you literally shouldn't have to. Some people start working. I, I started working when I was fourteen. You know, so I've been I've been working for a third of what other people have been work, working for. And when you get to that point, when you've worked for that long, don't you think some you've deserved to live out the rest of your days stress free in in peace? Isn't that what your retirement should be? You shouldn't have to worry about money. You shouldn't have to worry about how you're going to pay your rent or how you're going to cover your utilities. That should be covered for you. You shouldn't have to worry about what you're going to do for fun. And instead of Social Security, they preach you know, 401ks, which are tied to Wall Street, which are tied to the market. So if something happens, then there goes your fucking Social Security. Your retirement is tied into your your employer, which if your employer lets you go, then what happens? There's no more of that matching program. There's no more income going into that. They, they These employers, if they fire you, they, and this has never happened to me. I got fired from a corporation, and, uh, and I had a 401k with them that, um, you know, I took a percentage of my paycheck you know, let's just say, again, for the sake of easy math, we'll say $100 out of my paycheck. If I was getting paid $2,500 every paycheck, um, I took $100 out of that and I put it into this 401k and then the company would match that. So they would be, so I would essentially be putting in $200 
every paycheck. So if I was getting paid twice a month, it's $400 a month that would go into this thing. And then there was like a interest of whatever it was, right? They fired me. I can't put a, that 200 bucks a month in anymore and they're not matching that. So it's basically zero was going into that. So I have a 401k that's been doing nothing. So really, I mean, if they cared about it, then the corporation would say, We're, once you get fired, we will, um, while you're filing unemployment, we will just put in that additional $200 into that 401k um, or until you find a new job. So for the time of unemployment, uh, we will be putting money into it because we're firing you and you're leaving you without really any notion of getting a new job. But they don't. Um, you know, the corporate government says there's there's not enough for social programs all the time too, right? Like the cutting of social security. Well, we got to cut social security. We got to cut these uh, important medical programs for um, the most vulnerable in our society because uh, you know we gotta we gotta fund those wars. We gotta give handouts to corporations. They're I mean the corporate they're struggling. You know. I heard last year um, billionaires uh, weren't able to buy a, a jet yacht combo. I mean, that's, have you heard anything more depressing? Sure, um, um, you know, a, a family of four wasn't able to uh, feed their kids and haven't taken a vacation in 10 years, but that jet yacht combo, you know, what is this mega billionaire going to entertain the models in? How is he going to see scantily clad women or scantily clad men, whatever you're into? Have you heard anything? More? Sure, there were uh, millions of people that had health insurance uh, and weren't able to you know, afford medical treatments that they needed or medication that they needed, but scantily clad people. Has that not brought a tear to your eye? But, you know, when, when regular people are looking for basic human rights, people go, oh, you guys are lazy. You guys are just being lazy for, for, for wanting these uh, uh, basic human rights. But then we champion these corporations, right? We champion these billionaires that, that don't pay taxes on their billions and billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars. We champion, oh, these guys are amazing. We champion them for being cheats and liars. Another thing they believe in is decentralizing the energy system uh, with renewable technologies uh, like uh, rooftop solar, geothermal, stuff like that. We've already, we've actually known for a long time that solar is um, far more efficient than fossil fuels. It actually does provide us with more energy than uh, than fossil fuels. Uh, it's at least twice as efficient, um, and that's right now, right? with all of the restrictions and all of the pushback from the fossil fuel industry, we found that it's at least twice as efficient as, as energy that's coming from natural gas, energy that's coming from coal, that's energy that's coming from oil. Imagine how much more efficient we would have made it. Imagine how advanced our energy infrastructure would be if we had supported the research and put that into practice for solar energy for geothermal, for wind energy. And I'm not saying that there isn't. There is, but it's very limited. And it's taxed heavily, or there's pushback from the fossil fuel industry that most of these Democrats and Republicans will support the fossil fuel industry. Don't forget that Barack Obama let Exxon drill in the Arctic. Or was it Exxon or Shell? One of, the, one of, those, one of those horrific maniac companies. You, you lose track. Okay, get loose track. There's so many of these fucking sociopaths that are like, we got to burn more shit and put it into the atmosphere and we'll be fine. Set it all on fire. You know, that corporation. Um, but that's what we need more of. We need more of these. Uh, Tesla's been talking about solar roofs. They've been talking about solar batteries. Um, imagine if there were four or five companies that were doing that. Imagine if there was a government program funding all of this stuff. How much, how much money, time, and energy we could have put into it? If there was a political party that was, that was helping improve that technology. They've, uh, they've said that uh, 
it's like one fifth of the amount of space that the fossil fuel industry takes up is how much the solar energy would take up. And that would also create new jobs because you have to, you have to make these solar plants. You have to make these batteries, um, create a brand new grid system, uh, you know, that would inhabit that. And so that's jobs, that's infrastructure. And then you have to maintain, you know, have people that know what they're doing and regulating it. So, you know, what they claim is, oh, it's impossible. It is possible. It's just going to take some work. Maybe restructure the economy so we can. They also are encouraging food production and sustainable farming. I talked about this about a year or two ago. Maybe it's been two years since I've talked about this, but I did a whole forkful of noodles about why organic food is, is so expensive. And part of that was um, talking about, you know, different sort of agricultural things like regenerative farming. There's a guy named Robert Rodale that talked about regenerative farming, which is basically um, it's farming that uh, is enclosed uh, nutrient uh, loops to enrich soil. So the idea is like you don't plant the same thing in the same soil every single year, right? That you kind of seasonally um, plant certain crops. And those certain crops, after they're harvested, will leave the soil with nutrients in it so that when you come back, you know, you can plant more more food. The The soil keeps regenerating itself. It's it's just, it's kind of how nature operates. You know, it, it, does, it, it operates in these cycles. Um, you know, so, so think about it this way, right? Like you guys know how excited you get every October when like pumpkin spice lattes and pumpkin flavored bullshit comes in, um, you know, because it's that special time of the year where that special blend of like orange dye and pumpkin flavored chemicals are just thrown into lattes and cookies and M&Ms and all of those things. It's just like that, but like with real food and not poisons. Um, so if we could just get it used to that a little bit more to be like, oh, it's a rutabaga season. Cool. Let's go get some rutabagas. And if we'd run out of rutabagas, yeah, all right, that's okay. Maybe my neighbor has a, 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 you know, just a little extra rutabaga. Paradigm shift, you know, just societal cultural shifts. They also support vertical farming, which is basically using hydroponics AI climate control, um, and and it's this is a little bit limited because you can't do root plants because it's hydroponic. You can't do root plants, um, you know. So it's only like the hipster ones, kale, basil, man buns, uh, all the hipster plants that come through. Uh, but no, but vertical farming is 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 a, a direction that you can you can go in, um, and it's more efficient in terms of space usage. Uh, because you can't, um, you know, we do, we only have specific amounts of land. We only have a, a small amount of land, uh, that we can use for farming, but it also reduces toxins that go into our water supply, chemical runoffs. Um, it creates a healthier food source. It creates healthier communities. And realistically, it would be reduced prices too, uh, because there's not that employee cost. If you're going to automate it, right, there's technically less employment. Um, and the reason why organic foods are so expensive anyway is because of the regulatory needs that they need to go through, uh, that the government has put a, far, a lot more regulations on that sort of stuff, the far far more regulations on organic foods than non-organic foods, for sure. So, so more chemically treated foods are actually cheaper because they have less regulations to use uh, whatever chemicals. So that's sort of what the Movement for a People Party really stands for um you know a lot of people will look at this and kind of go well this is not the time for this and this has been happening for at least 22 years i've heard this excuse since i've been in this country i've been hearing this excuse every single year every single year there's any sort of like progressive candidate any anybody that sort of brings up alternative ideas these bold ch radical change ideas well this is not the time for it this is the most important election of our time. This is not the time for radical change because it's the most important election of ever. It's not the, yeah, okay. If it is the most important election ever, why don't we act like it is? If it's really that important and we have to move the country forward, why don't we actually take the fucking steps to do it? 
why why say it's the most important election ever and then go back to doing the same bullshit that keeps us from moving forward that continues to just grind us into a halt that spins our wheels over and over again why keep supporting that system if this is the most important election ever let's act like it is and start making bold changes pushing back on the status quo right let's let's do something that can actually drive change and show the establishment how important these ideas really are. Stand by our belief systems rather than fawning over a party. Because you want the Democratic Party to be progressive. That you want the Republican Party to be the party of the people. They're not going to be. They're parties of the corporation. They're parties of Wall Street. That's what they are. They have always been that way. Every single time that we've said, oh, it's the most important election ever. We got to... We got to vote with intel. Yeah, vote with intelligence. Vote with your belief system. This is the intelligent way to go. Voting for status quo is not. Why give up? Why compromise? Why compromise what you believe in? Why compromise the change that we can make? What is the point of that? Right? This is the time that that you should be voting for your belief system. And if there isn't a candidate that stands for that, then fuck it. Support a system that is. Show that Democratic Party that, that we're not going to show up at the convention because you don't stand for what we believe in. It's the same thing as what happened with the Whigs. We're not going to stand up and vote for a party that that is going to... Uh, legislate on the behalf of the corporate elites and give us barely half-hearted platitudes. We shouldn't be sitting there and saying, well, you know, I'm going to I'm going to do my part because it's the most important election. I'm going to hold my nose and vote for somebody that doesn't stand for what I believe in, that doesn't stand for moving this country forward, that actually wants to move this country 16 years backwards so that in another 8 years we can arrive right back to where we started. Voting isn't a fish market. You shouldn't hold your nose and pick something and get the fuck out of there and hope that smell doesn't follow you home. And this is coming from somebody that's waited 22 fucking years to exercise their right to vote. I had to fight for it. I had to earn it. I went through years of xenophobia. I went through years of racism levied against me. I went through years of, of, of people making legislation on my behalf, and I had no fucking say in it whatsoever. So I'm not going to hold my nose and vote against my belief system. Sorry, that's not going to happen, and neither should you. We should be asking for something better, and here's something better right here. A movement for a people's party is something better. Is, 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 is exactly what it sounds like. It's a party based on a movement. It's a party based on political organizing. It's a party based on the people. We should follow our beliefs. We should think critically. We should be intelligent. And we should be voting with that in mind. We should be voting with that in mind. Voting for this duopoly is not going to change anything. It's not going to make lives better. You know, there's people that are like, oh, the fascists are going to come down. They're already here. Good authoritarians will convince you that you're in a democracy, and then you vote in fascism. That's what you do. And we've been doing that for, you know, three or four decades. So let's, let's vote for something a little bit better. There are other political parties. That you can break away from the Democrats. You can break away from the Republicans. That's a possibility. We just have to be bold enough to take it. We have to be as bold as people were in 1852 to sit there and say, um, this party that I belong to is not really talking about things that I believe in. I'm done with it. I'm going to go in a different direction.
they don't automatically get your votes because you registered with them. They have to earn it. So ask that question. Have they earned your vote? Has the MPP earned your vote? Has the Green Party earned your vote? Have the Libertarians earned your vote? Who has earned your vote with what they're saying? Who has earned your vote by lining up with what you believe in? That's what's important. That's how we should be voting. All right. That is, uh, that is the end of this Friday uh, session. I hope, uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope you guys got some valuable information. I hope you guys got to think about some things. Um, I'm not one for uh, easy answers. <laughs> um, and I am sure that uh, there are going to be a bunch of people that are going to... Because uh, I'm the little guy, right? Like, I don't, I don't have a gigantic following, so it's a lot easier to make me the whipping boy and attack me. Uh, and people have attacked me already. Uh, there's, you know, the comment sections, there's a few people that have shown up to attack me for not voting blue no matter who. Um, and I'm sure we'll have a couple. Uh, and uh, I'm going to do what I always do, which is to not get insult, insulting. I'm not going to throw a bunch of insults. I'm not going to throw uh, a bunch of, you know, rude, mean comments. I'm going to stick to the facts. I'm going to do what, exactly what I do here. I'm going to break it all down um, and, uh, and hope that you guys get something cool out of it. I, don't, I have no interest in fighting with people. I'm, I'm more interested in, in discourse and debate. A lot of people like to, den like, it's, it gets difficult when people deny the facts where, there are some people that are that basically come out and they're like, oh, everything that, you know, progressive media says about Joe Biden is wrong and lies. OK, but how? And they're like, it just is. Because I don't like it. So, Wait, what? That's not how f fucking facts and reality works. Uh, and I and I and I genuinely worry for those people because I don't I'm just like, I don't know how to fucking help you. Like you are just set in creating this new reality for yourself and i you know okay hopefully you'll come out of that so um yeah uh anyway that's uh that's your friday uh tomorrow will be storytelling saturday i'll be i'm talking about my the first time i did uh stand up and i have to throw in this retraction is because i'm an idiot and i said it was 17 years it's 15 years uh this is year 15 because <laughs> i'm a dumb dumb and forgot how math works. Uh, so we're at 15, not 17. I don't know where 17 came up. It just, I think I just uh, calculated something wrong. I don't, I don't even know. Uh, but I'm a dum-dum. I made a mistake. It's 15 years. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you guys a story of what, what the first time that I, you know, my first stand-up show was uh, 15 years ago. Um, and, uh, and then we'll go live on Sunday. Um, I've got a few topics that uh, I think might be interests in the same kind of uh, same kind of sphere as um, what we discussed today. Kind of keeping in, in line with that theme, and that's going to be around noon. Um, as always, if you enjoyed this content, if you think this contest content is interesting, please give it a like. Please give it a share. Um, you know, so uh, I. And, and again, I'm going to have uh, Nick Brana from the Movement for a People's Party on my podcast, Taboo Table Talk, coming up soon. Um, sooner rather than later, I think. Uh, and if that means I'm going to have to skip a week of the extended dispatch, then I think that's what it's going to have to be. And the other thing that I want to bring up, too, with Taboo Table Talk is I'm going to be trying to do interviews with small business owners, small venue owners, um, I might reach out to some people personally, um, but if you are a small business owner or a small venue owner or know any small business or small venue owners, um, send me a message. I would love to talk to you. I would love to find out uh, uh, how you are going through this quarantine session and how people can help you out during this quarantine session. So go ahead and feel free to send me a message. Um, I'll try to reach out to some people that I know 
And, you know, I'm not looking for, it doesn't have to be super long conversations, even if it's like 10 or 15 minutes of, of, of here's how things have been, here's how we've been dealing with it, here's how you can help. Uh, that'd be great. So I'm going to try to do that for Tablet Table Talk along with the extended dispatches as well. So uh, with that said, uh, the last thing you can do is obviously donate ramennoodlescomedy.com slash donate. Um, it's not mandatory. All my content will be available for you to enjoy for free every single day. Uh, make sure you are subscribed to the channels. Make sure you're getting all the notifications because we're dropping a bunch of videos. And to the people that have already donated, already subscribed, already sharing this content, I, I love you. I appreciate you. You guys are my heroes. We'll see you tomorrow.